a rather odd uh, subject of uh, writing poetry during uh, the, the virus. But the, I'd like to start by saying that any writer, whether he's a, or she is a poet or a novelist, I consider myself more a novelist than a poet at the moment, uh, with three three novels. Uh, the, uh, the the emphasis is on your private concerns and your private dreams, your predilections, and how you hold uh, an hour or two to yourself where you can create something. Now, I was just looking at a notebook of mine, and I find on uh, the new year of 2019, a totally different world. And I wrote a small poem, Hope in Our Times. That was the time when the Sabri Malla agitation was going on and people were saying things about the Raphael. Just six lines, I'll read them out just to, uh, just to convince myself how things have changed. Night bulletins are rife with Raphael and Sabrimalla as bare-chested devotees keep the pot churning. Hear the cold, dense, heavy as a chokidar adds twigs and bribe bark to keep chaff fires burning. Hope and light, small time thieves in the fog, cling stealthily to something close to yearning. And through a hole in the mist, suddenly a barbet calls, the ear is turning. So things have changed. And I, like a lot of other people, think of myself in two lockdowns. The first knockdown was the one where I suddenly found that my money was no longer legal tender. I am a Democrat and I am not very happy with somebody getting on the stage and saying, your money is no longer legal tender and you have four hours now Otherwise, it's a lockdown for 21 days, and the 21 days is extended for another 21 days, and it, it, it goes on. But I follow all the rules. I, uh, at 7 o'clock, I did all the clapping with my hands and uh, lighted candles, uh, four candles we were asked for, and I, I think I, landed, I uh, lit five and I follow the rules. Like other writers, I come to writing with complexes, with inhibitions. For instance, I don't, I really go against my own currents and don't want to write something dismal because I've had a few bleak years, uh, especially after an accident in the year 2000, but uh, one goes on. Now, during the semi-intellectual lockdown, one wrote poems and one wrote articles. I, I write a column. And I, I found that one has to speak out sometime or the other. And I wrote poems and I would like to at least read one of them, or two of them. If they ask, that will hit you. 
Uh, it's going to be published in uh, an American magazine called uh, MOA. Uh, I think it comes out from Honolulu University. If they ask, if they ask the hulks, belly touching the steering, headlights blazing on a canal road, where you are off to, say I missed the last bus, I'm walking home. And if they ask for your village, don't say Casablanca, Djibouti, some city salted by the Mediterranean breeze and fringed with olives. Just mention Karkhoda, Khekla, anything that grates on the tongue like sand paper. And if they ask your name, say, say it boldly, not too loud though. Munim Khan or Zainuddin or Zulfikar. And if they ask, are you circumcised? Don't nod quietly, but say yes. And if they persist, when did you last kill a cow? And I hope to God you haven't said truthfully, never. And when they nod and say, you can go, nod and leave. Uh, but when you are writing about, uh, when you are writing about a lockdown, a knockdown, you have to be humorous in a way. Bring in humor, bring in satire, and chug along. There's no point criticizing the times, the ziyadjist, or as we say in Urdu, the zamana. The zamana is very important. And in Urdu poetry, you are banging your head against the zamana, just as so are we. We are also banging our heads against the times and against the corona virus. And there is a light poem, uh, which I, I may read, uh, which is called uh, Manurishi's Discomfort. Manurishi was in discomfort. Spasms had turned neck and shoulder into an earthquake zone at which the Sarsang Chalak asked, What ails you, Guruji? Are hornets troubling you? Some prickly vastra or shawl you wish to be rid of? When questioned repeatedly, Manu replied in exasperation, I have no shawl. It is Hindutva I wish to be rid of. Trouble was that neither Manu Rishi nor Sarsang Chalak had heard of that metaphor in Blech, Pasha, an albatross around the neck. Two. Meanwhile, Hindutva, emblazoned in a golden t shirt, swaggered into the plaza, meaning chalk in our native language after having triumphantly lynched a cattle transporter. Suddenly, he was accosted by a crowd of SCs and STs who asked him, do you believe in Manu? Hindutva, truthful guy, straight as the stick, answered, I believe in Manu, but I do not believe in discrimination meaning Bhedbhav. When word reached Manu Rishi, busy redrafting his Smriti to be published by Penguin Random House, the Rishi said, who but Brahma can extricate us from this impasse? So all three ancient saints modern Hindutva and timeless Sarsang Chalak proceeded to Brahma and folding their hands said, Hey Prabhu, 
let us get us out of this mess. And Brahma answered briskly, neither can Manu be rid of Hindutva, nor can Hindutva be rid of Manu. Now, when you are confronting a big, I mean, this is cataclysmic for mankind. I mean, we have never had a virus as black as this, though the Black Death caused us 150 to 200 million deaths over a century or so. And possibly this may also go on and on, but we all pray that it stops. It stops somewhere. And allegory comes to you naturally and the Black Death came to me naturally when I was asked for an anthology of poems. And I wrote a clutch of poems. And again, when you start a constellation of poems on such a, such a topic, you would want, at least I would want, to start with something, something light. And I found a prologue. So you have a prologue where you can write your nonsense and then have the actual constellation of sonnets. And these are all sonnets. And I'll read the, the first one to you. And that's when the devil uh, starts talking. The, and he is stationed in uh, the Hilton Hotel. And he's, I have to ask, uh, write another sonnet where he'll cheat the hotel cashier and run away from the hotel without paying his bill. The devil never left Black Death in the foyer. This is 500 years or 600 years back we are talking. The devil never left Black Death in the foyer to be discussed at length in devastating detail. Cleverer than Satan and Iblis, those soul sawyers, he couldn't ever fail. He checked out of Hilton. Memory had him dismayed. Didn't the hotel echo some rhymester of yore? Yes, of course, the guy who needed hearing aids, his verse sonorous as a river gorge. Having planted Brexit, the devil thought of exits. Make a run for it though sad to leave Hilton. In poor English, he said, this place is truly gala. His task severe, bury memories of black death in some catafalque, beyond the ridge of sonneteering bums like Daruwala. And the second sonnet is without a rhyme and de deliberately, I'll, I'm reading it out. And this is about the Black Death in a way. The boats don't keel as they unload their cargo. And the Black Death, which has no nameplate yet, you know, when you're writing poetry, you not say that Black Death didn't have a name by then. It started and slowly they gave it a name. So when you're writing verse, you say, and the Black Death, which has no nameplate yet. That, that's the way you, you write modern terse poetry. I'll read that again. The poets don't keel, sorry, the boats don't keel, which means tilting. The boats don't keel as they unload their cargo and the Black Death, which has no nameplate yet, clambers up Europe's back. The fates, hard put to watch, 
its moves have sin on their minds and redemption. Those were the cultural, religious exhortations. It moves have sin on their minds and redemption can crown a monk's cowl, save a soul. They are all meshed up here, your highnesses from Greek houses, naked corpses. A friar shouts, wash the sickness down the sea till he is scythed himself. Nations outlaw coffin, ceremonies, shroud, or was it Blake that did it? The cardinal hands over a year's hard labor for the crime. The scribbler asks, what have I done, my lord? You dared write a sonnet without a rhyme. <laughs> but now come the sonnets, and I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to read two. May I? Black Death, number one. The summons were from the, I must tell you, the Byzantium court had a king. Uh, he has a, his name was John Cantaco Zenos, and he lost his son, 13 years old, to the Black Death, to the plague. The summons were from the Byzantium court. He was wanted there. The king's son was dead. The advance guard of bubos. Bubos were the glands which separated in the armpits. The advance guard of bubos had got him. How did he take it? He asked. He asked the messenger. The king's eyes bled. The messenger answered, Isaac, coiner and scribe, tried to address the king in that ornate hall, but hysteria ruled, courtiers screamed, the Tartars, stricken with disease, threw plague across the wall. The Tartars were besieging uh, this particular fort, and their own people, diseased with the Black Death, they threw over the walls into the city so that it surrenders. They catapulted corpses into the city. The royal ribs withstood a, mess, withstood a shudder. Think of Kaffa. Kaffa is the, tor, is the name of the town. That Genoese port, not terror, but think of pity. Leave witches alone and their ghastly spells and keep the Jews away. They have suffered enough. And no, they haven't put poison in our wells. The rumors went along and they said that the Jews have done this or the witches have done that. And they have actually poisoned the wells. And that is why we are hit by the plague. But that was not the case. I'll read the third, which is the queen talking. How did we falter? My queen asks, young, timorous, as it steps out from her just withered face. It's just withered because her son has died. I'll read that again. How did we falter? My queen asks, young, timorous, as it steps out from her just withered face. Were defilers aboard in our kingdom? Blasphemers? Did usurers have a free run of the marketplace? Has your executioner taken leave of his acts? She asked the king. He is dead, my lady, of the disease. And during Lent, she keeps on. Did the peasantry fast with us? Some were lax, but our kingdom no longer 
is a divine instrument. I'll read the stanza again because I interrupted myself. Has your executioner taken leave of his acts? He is dead, my lady, of the disease. And during Lent, did the peasantry fast with us? Some were lax, but our kingdom no longer a divine instrument. Whose wrath have been incurred then? Some scullions from devil's kitchen or an enraged spark divine? Wife, too many heresies around, trackers of bad smells, gluttons of good beef, but guzzlers of bad wine. And the whole thing moves through hell. The plague moves on for death. It is harvest time. Who dies tomorrow? Rodents alone can tell. Now all this is rather dismal and I don't wish to re uh, leave you in anything dismal. I'm reading, I'm going to read two small poems. One on the, a poem to my granddaughter. Poem for a granddaughter who gets a little frightened at da, of the da. Okay. Freyana is her name. Do not fear the dark, my child. Dark is quieter than the day. Listen to silence for a while. That cricket too has gone away. The one that chittered all evening long. She burrows in her quiet sleep, wrapped in leaf and dream and bark. The night was made for slumber deep. Nothing is lighter than a dream. It's lighter than an insect's wings. As it covers up her eyes, quieter silence, yet it sings of hope and friends and play and fun and flares with your tiny past. You would have dreams. Sorry, if you lived near the sea, you would have dreams of sail and mast. If in the hills, you would have dreamt of shepherd, flock, and valleys green, of rivers clean as burnished glass, and watched the salmon go upstream. Night should hold no terrors, child, Nothing is wrong with black and dark. Sometimes things are what they seem. A stillness and a dog's lone bark is almost there. Is, is, is almost all there is tonight. There are no ghosts. There are no gulls. The cry you heard is a night bird stirring in his sleep. An owl. I don't want to read the whole poem. And I have one more lasting shot, and that is the miracle. And I wrote it on the millennium, though the millennium proved rather bad for me and my family. We had an accident. The miracle of the dawn prayer, gold in its hair and of the vespers, lamp black after dusk, and the monotone of the night cricket, solitary articulate, the miracle of high pastures, a dwarf deer's gland of musk. The miracle of the snow line, melt line, water roar, glacier green as a carbuncle, River gleaming white, mirroring the clouds. No clouded leopard here, says the herdsman. What troubles us is the black panther, blacker than the night. I'm going over the high pastures. I am a trekker. I've been over 18,000 quite often, 18,000 feet. The seasons 
sensual as flesh as they go the rounds. The promontory crowded with vultures, this estuary marked with gulls, the sea there as always, and the harbor swarming with schooner and sailboat, rudders, masts, and hulls. Brittle coral, firm as a rock, thick smell of frying fish, the lighthouse so wrapped in history, it forgot to turn on the light. But constellations switch on their mysteries as the Magi fish for omens. Sing hymns celebratory. Sorry. Sings. Sing hymns celebratory. Forget sickness, blight. The wonder of the calendar that makes us forget. The ears are seamless. Come on, turn the page. This miracle, the world dragged by time's oxen into another furrow, another seedbed, another age. I wish to thank the college, the gracious principal, Dr. Swati Paul, and everybody uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. But I'm waiting for questions, and I hope there are some. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you so I didn't much. go. I hope I didn't go over the head of. Not at people. all. Not at all. It was absolutely fascinating. I wish you'd just carried on. I mean, I was completely enjoying listening to you. So I wish you'd carried on. Would you like to read one or two more poems of yours? Are you sure? Of course. <laughs> I I could. Please. Okay, I'll I'll read. Can I read a Sappho poem? Anything. Sappho was the Greek poetess, and in Lesbos, and she was in love both with uh, people of the same gender and also with a male. And she would write to the goddess of love, which is Venus or Aphrodite. But I, when I took over. When took over writing on her, I said, let us talk of her when she's old. And she's again addressing Aphrodite, and but as an old woman. Here it is. Goddess, I'm lonely now. Okay, she's old. She's bereft of her lovers, and she's old. Goddess, I'm, and don't forget the sapphic stanza. The staphic sansa is eight syllables, and the fourth line would be of just four syllables. I followed the staphic stanza. Goddess, I am lonely now, a tragic harvest in your net. The Pleiades and the moon have set. I sleep alone. You see, that's the fourth line. I sleep alone. Love's delirium does not last. I've learned that lesson from the past. The emptiness that follows lust scars me to the bone. Again, the short line. Love's desertions, they are swift as star clusters incline and shift. My lovers like Orion drift. I drift alone. Uh, the Orion drifts over the sky. That's the only constellation that drifts across the sky. And my first poetry book was called Under Orion. I wrote that and it was published in 1970. And it's my 50th year, or rather the 50th year for my first book. Fantastic. Uh, congratulations for that. Thank you. Do you want me to read another? Yes. Of course. The last. All right. This is a. Sorry, I'll have to. I wasn't prepared for this, so. Could you read? Could you read to us one of your death poems? Sorry. Could you read uh, to us one of 
your death poems, you know, you've, you've got a couple of death poems, poems on death. Why, why do you want me to read on death? I've, I've been writing because on... Because it is, I've, because it is close to our heart, that is right. And it is imminent. Uh, and because you write about it... I read two, I could read two sonnets, but I'm, I, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, if I... I have a poem, a satirical poem, We the God of Us, which means we. But I don't know. I've read that in one second, one second. Can't find it. I'm sorry. I must have. Yes. Or read it. Yeah. A, tra a traveler speaks to the Lama. Do you mind? Please, please. And the traveler speaks to the Lama. And he wants to know from the Lama if he has ever had an epiphany. You know what an epiphany is something from the divine, uh, a sign from the divine. The traveler speaks to the Lama, Epiphany. The walnut tree in front of the Gompa was on fire. Why is it on fire? Because it was autumn. <laughs> Sorry. The walnut tree in front of the Gompa was on fire, but not the willow. Red-robed boys ushered into premature monkhood had stopped playing at dusk as dusk fell when I startled the Lama with a series of questions. After 40 years in the monastery, have you ever received a sign? In some odd moment, has the shadow of the Sakyamuni fallen like a cloak on your shoulders? He stopped twirling his prayer wheel, the Buddhists, you know, and you must have seen in your monasteries. You are talking of an instant, aren't you? A ray moment of light that fills your being. I nodded. He thought on it a while. Just once, he said. It was about to snow, and I saw the snow leopard, smoky, gray, his spots still distinct in the murk. He looked at me, the solitude of Ladakh, of wilderness and winter was in his eyes. The air turned frost brittle. Something broke somewhere in the sky bowl and the snow came down, but the leopard couldn't care. It fell on his face, ran down his eyes like candle wax. Sorry. It fell on his face, ran down his eyes like candle wax. We are talking about the snow. But he, we kept looking at each other till the landscape shrank because when the snow is there, the, the, the landscape almost shrinks and you can't see beyond 20 feet or 30 feet. It fell on his face, I'm repeating, it fell on his face, the snow. It fell on his face, ran down his eyes like candle wax, but we kept looking at each other till the landscape shrank. And I prayed to the guardians of the four quarters to guard not just me, and the gompa from evil, but the valley, willow, walnut, and leopard. Cover his tracks from the hunter's eyes. Cover his hide against buckshot and lead. It has stayed with me. This memory filtered by dusk, this moment leavened by snow. Thank you. 
It's really beautiful. Namita, please take over. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank Dharma. you. Thank you. It was beautiful. Thank you. You're at equal ease with nature, myth, observed social reality. It's been a real treat to listen to you, Mr. Daruwala. A bold voice and such technical finesse. But I won't stand between you and the questions. So what I have done is I have, since there are lots of questions, I have clubbed them into groups of uh, topics. Uh, uh, Dr. Pal, could we begin with your question? Would you like to ask it yourself? Oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> uh, I actually had two questions uh, yeah. for you, uh, you know, as I was listening to you and also because one knows a little bit about you as a person. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you, and it's always fascinated me about not just poets, but about writers, the fact that, you know, the romantics, uh, I think it was Shelley who said that poets are the uh, legislators of the world. If, if I'm not mistaken, it was Shelley but my memory fails me. So do you think that writers, and in particular poets, have a special mission in terms of the fact that more than anybody else, they need to take a stand to be fearless because you have been very, very fearless as a person. You have written very uh, you know, openly about what you feel should be the right stand. And do you think that therefore one's writing should reflect that? And the other thing that I wanted to ask you was about humor, because you, you've been constantly saying it's important to be, to bring in humor, and of course it is. But isn't that the most difficult of all things to evoke, you know, uh, at the best of times, to be, to, to evoke humor? I think it can be quite excruciating for a writer. These were my questions, simple questions. Uh, the second question is, uh, humor has to be uh, a part of you. But you should be very careful that it doesn't turn into burlesque. So uh, uh, satire can help. A little satire, a little irony uh, can always bring in some humor, if, if that's the that's the answer. And I do feel that whether you are a poet or a novelist, you have to stand up. But you should not turn into a journalist. I mean, if you bring it into a novel, I have my last novel. This is my last novel, uh, Serving to Solitude, Letters to Mama. And I have brought in the allegory. But the Allegory has been lost on the readers totally. I've started with the emergency and they don't feel that it is an allegory of the, the times we are living in actually. So uh, you have mishaps, if I may call them, uh, when, you are, when you are standing up for, uh, for principles, but you have to. Whether it's a short story, I'm coming out with a book of long stories, which has no politics in it. There, there it is. So, because I've been writing it over 10 years, those long stories, and there is nothing, uh, uh, there is nothing uh, problematic about them. I hope I answered the question. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there are two sorts of questions. One that requests you for tips uh, for writing. I'll read out a group of these questions. And the second, second kind of question is about the relevance uh, of uh, Corona related poetry or poetry written about or during the times of Corona. So let me read these questions together. Are there any rules for writing poetry? Could you share tips for writing for young poets? Uh, uh, how can uh, uh, how can poetry be made relevant uh, in today's times? How can poetry offer relief in this materialistic period when we are governed by rational concepts? How important is it to use difficult words? Is it more important to touch the heart? Um, will the Corona theme continue to inspire new? You should stop here somewhere. There's many of them. Okay, can I, so can probably, I answer a few? two themes. One is tips and the second is Corona. First, 
first tip, if I may say so, is memorize poetry. I mean, I was in a very, very big college and the head of the department, I, I recited a line from a poet and I was told that this was in your time. Now when we uh, want a line or a poem, we just go to Google. That's not the correct answer. You must, you must. There is sweet music here, there's softer falls than pet petals from blown roses on the grass or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite in a gleaming pass. Music that gentlier on the spirit lies like uh, tired eyelids upon tired eyes. Music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies. Now, you, you must, you, and you are happy when you recite these. I, I can recite a lot of Shakespeare. I can re re recite a little of Auden. And uh, there it is. So that is the first thing. Secondly, keep a notebook. Whatever, these days I'm writing half poems. I forget, I'm getting old and I'm getting forgetful. I write half a poem, then get up to have a drink of water or a cup of tea. Uh, then a phone rings somewhere as it just now was ringing at the moment. And you forget the next half of the poem. And of course, I, uh, you, you, you have heard of Kubla Khan, uh, Coleridge. Uh, some fool came in and rang the bell and while he was writing uh, his poem, uh, he was transcribing his dream in Zenadu did Kubla Khan, a stately pleasure, dome decree. I can recite that, but I don't want to. <laughs> Where half the sacred river ran in caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. And he forgot, and the poem is half finished. So keep a small notebook. When something strikes you, uh, very often it is striking me while, while I'm almost sleeping and I don't get up. I'll say, oh, I'll remember it tomorrow morning and I don't remember a thing. So keep a small notebook. Write down your feelings. Write down your observation. Your, as a poet or a short story writer or a writer, you have to have keen observation. And uh, that, is, that is very important. So that would be my second tip. And the third would be to have some rhythm in your lines. I find that the technology, the Morse code, and the Morse code came in a uh, hundred years earlier, but uh, telegraph and all the rest have turned the rhythms of poetry into you know, something syncopated, as you know, you know, dash, dash, dot, dot. Have, have your rhythms. That's why I write these sonnets absolutely in, in the classical manner. Sorry, classical is a big word. I shouldn't be using it for, for my own writing. But I write it in the traditional. When I write a sonnet, I write a sonnet in the traditional manner. 14 lines, uh, no longer than, no more than 14 lines. And it, it just goes on and on. I hope I have answered some questions. And keep a dream log. I kept a dream log. I used to mark every dream for three months or four months. And then I stopped. Firstly, because it started foreshadowing things. I thought of a uh, death and it didn't hit me hard in the dream. And later on, uh, the help in my house, he passed away. There it was. Then I left it. But, and your sleep is not as deep as it is because your conscious is uh, also working along with the unconscious. So you want to get down and write down the dream and the written dream is so different from the actual dream but a dream log helps you i still have a dream log i had a book night river i don't have it here 
but in my night river there were quite a few dreams which i picked up from the dream log keep a dream log keep notes observe things and mark books and read for heaven's sake read don't uh, look at the tv i just look at the news and i pay a lot i paid last year 14000 for tata sky uh, netflix and all i never saw a single netflix uh, movie or anything no do i and i don't know how to go to uh, do it my daughters keep on giving me these uh, uh, vd what is it called the uh, cd um, sorry the word slips me but i don't know how to operate them just as well <laughs> go ahead ah uh, so there's this question thank you there's this question from suti goswami how do we negotiate the thin line between accepting the inevitability of death and attachment to remaining alive did you what get what you want between the two yeah between the two and i also want to add that a lot of people are writing to us saying how moving and touching some of your poems are they're deeply affected and there are a lot i'm sure a lot of people have this question about life death and change coping Thank strategy you. whatever there's nothing you can alter this is the human condition if you if you read full reveal thinking of the lions the weary condition of humanity born under one law to another bound vainly begot and yet forbidden vanity born sick commanded to be sound what meaneth nature by these diverse laws passion and reason self division cause but he is talking under the uh, he is a renaissance man and he is talking under the christian ethic you you know you start life under a cloud um, and uh, the uh, the great sin i don't know what the great sin is i'm not a christian but uh, so the human condition is this you're born you have a short span of life whatever it is and you go and all that you have imbibed in your brain all that you have experienced goes with you the loved ones also stay with you even after they have gone in your memory when you go the loved ones will also go because no one will remember them so that is that is life and it's a part of it and we are all a part of it and don't be dismal about it when we have to go we have to go and keep i i, I believe that these days uh, a lot of us are death obsessed i think how many lakhs have gone in this virus already more over 2 lakhs but uh, keep death and the thought of death at a distance please do that read read pickwick papers <laughs> rather than anything dismal by charles dickens uh, and do do reading a lot of reading not this uh, remote control and switching channels and the television i think it's a disaster the television has also this this too is a disaster uh, the mobile but it's an old man talking so you come to your own conclusions i never think of myself as an old man still you shouldn't <laughs> So there are these uh, questions about the times of Corona. I'll just read them yeah. quickly. Um, what will be the role of a poet in the new normal age? Will intense poetry survive via this virtual space? And will the Corona theme continue to inspire new poetry? Will the commonality of this theme take away the freshness of ideas? And many such questions. 
about new directions of poetry if you see any emerging at this time uh, also there is a, a repeated request from uh, pratibha rao for you to read an excerpt from prose from your latest novel if possible oh okay i will i will uh, but you know the corona is a reality it's a tremendous reality and if you are writing poetry and serious poetry you have to grapple with it so whatever uh, the stance you take the angle you take you are also a, or you are also a camera man or a camera uh, lady you are also photographing reality whether it's in your poetry or in your short stories or in anything you like that is that is what it is so you have to grapple with corona and each one will do it in her own way or his own way so there's nothing i can say about it but it is a reality and if you want to skip it if you want to avoid it i suppose you can avoid it there are uh, poets who avoid uh, reality and uh, write about what they feel is important to them so that that answers one what is the other question in this sorry i uh, i'm it's sorry about uh, if they were both related they are they are both about uh, staying fresh staying relevant um and uh, new directions i think the question on new directions in poetry post the covid that was, i added yes <laughs> that's very interesting that's a very that's a very interesting you know do you see mr daruwal any new directions emerging in poetry post this covid period both stylistically as well as content wise yeah me hi se and i'm talking to the scholars uh, in your college i'm not addressing the staff don't get obsessed by what is happening i uh, this will this too will pass black death also passed the justinian plague also passed i incidentally when i was in oxford at uh, i was there for a year and uh, i'm not a oxonian i never call myself an oxonian i just went as a scholar and uh, at uh, st anns it's a college uh, every monday they used to have a lecture and the one was on the thorn in india 19th century plague in india we had uh, this uh, plague just 15 years back and uh, latour uh, latour had uh, earthquakes latour had plague and two years or three years back water trains were being sent to latour there was no water uh, i mean water water place i have never visited it i'd love to go there one day and there it is the these are things uh, that are happening so i i don't think for the young young people to get too obsessed by what is happening keep safe keep your masks on keep your uh, uh, have your uh, walks absolutely alone or a treadmill or whatever you can and pass through this one bad year which we are i'm certain in for read write it's a it's a good time for writing incidentally uh, like you i also went into why well, i didn't go into depression but i started reading uh, dante's inferno i am now on the 13th or the 14th canto and there it is 
if you have a book like that, draw it out from your library. But Dante is too tough and too difficult. I wouldn't advise uh, uh, anyone to go for it. I hope that is. You you can't have all answers. Uh, nothing nothing in life uh, is there for which you can give an answer. Uh, you can be a Shri Shri or be a Rishi. There are no answers. And in any case, Shri Shri has to first pay the five crores. I keep on writing in my articles that he has to pay the five crores for he was fined for which he uh, damaged the Jamna embankment. I, I never lose sight of these things as a columnist. I haven't written that in, in, in a novel. Oh, do, do I? Yes, sir. If you could read from a novel. The latest was the request. Yes. I don't know. You have but a huge I, fan I, club. I, had, uh, I wish I had. There is something on the. Uh, Okay, I'll I'll read what I always read, which is a bit of a shame, but the emergency comes in, and this is this novel I started writing as a woman. Seema writes, and her mother was left a journal. That is also a, so I practiced uh, three stories earlier written by women and embarked on the novel. Every book has to be a challenge. I mean, if you are a writer, you have to face challenge, I, challenges. I mean, I told you Night River, I faced uh, dreams. Uh, there's another book, I, uh, which is all exploratory. And I explore, it's, it's like ge geography, and there it is. And this, this wife is married to uh, Deputy Secretary Seema Singh. And uh, the, the novel ends with well, uh, a lot of bickering, bickering, but she gets solitude in the end. And she has no idea that the emergency has been proclaimed. And she bothers her husband, what is all this? The, the, uh, this uh, newspapers, uh, there, are, uh, there are blank spaces in the newspaper. And then the husband comes in. And uh, when Nishant returned around nine, Nishant is her husband, uh, around nine in the evening, I heard the full story. It seems at midnight, while the president was in the bathtub, what was he doing at midnight in the bathtub, for Christ's sake? Having a bloody bath, Seema, what else? Well, there was a knock on the bathroom door. The president of India. Who is it? asked the president. Oh, Mehta, Minister of State, for whom, sir? What do you want? Sir, you may kindly sign this ordinance. That was the emergency ordinance. Let me first dry myself, said the president. I mean, let me first soap myself, then wash the soap off, and then dry myself. You got me confused. After seven minutes, the door squealed open. The papers were passed on to him and he signed. When later he was put up before one of the 50 commissions set up by the Janta government and asked whether he had seen the signing authority, the minister denied seeing him sign. The signatures were affixed in sanitized Privacy, Your Honor, said his defense lawyer, who held an Emmy 
Master of Euphemisms degree from St. Stephen's. So how would you know the document bore the president's signature? Did you need, did you send the document to a handwriting expert? Uh, to a handwriting expert? And uh, before, the, before implementing what was in the ordinance, Mr. Minister, I mean Mr. Ex-Minister, asked the learned judge, chairman of the commission, minister had no answer. Why didn't the president step out of the bathroom and sign? Your honor, said the defense lawyer representing the minister, the president had a towel wrapped around him, judge. Has the towel been produced in evidence as an exhibit? The attorney general sprang up to the defense of the prosecution, worried that the commission was looking for a loophole to acquit the ex-minister of state of home affairs, MHA. Your honor, it was too wet to be packed and sealed. I go on and on. I don't want to read this, but that is the humorous part of the emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daruwala. Do you have time to take more questions or uh, should we uh, stop here? I, I could take the questions, but the Zoom has seems to have almost switched off. No, no. The Zoom is alive. Don't worry. But on. if you could just take the last two questions. Yeah, last. Yes, I'll answer. Thank you. So the last question is, uh, last two questions are, can poetry be inseparable in true sense from the poet's perspective to make the voice of masses rather than the cry of an individual? No, I didn't get it. The, can poetry be inflexible? From no, it says inseparable in true sense from the poet's own perspective. So the, I think the uh, person, uh, uh, Dr. Kumar, is asking about the voice of the masses versus individual perspective. How representative can poetry be? And this, did you get that? No, I think I have not understood the question. Possibly I think, because I think, he, uh, I think the, he means, uh, is, do you see any difference between the poet's own perspective and as in representing the problem of uh, the masses or society? Is I, there, think, I think he's poet. asking for an opinion. He's asking you that do you feel that yes. a poet has... Uh, a, a certain uh, ra a duty towards the masses and therefore should his poetry or her poetry reflect the voice of the masses or should a poet be true to himself or herself and you know give voice only to his or her own feelings I, I would answer this way that the poet has to be himself he shouldn't be representing any lobby shouldn't be representing his community that's what I would have against the, some of the Dalit poetry. If, it, mm. if the poet is talking about himself and his own experiences, fine. But if he is only talking about the community, uh, uh, that would, uh, that would uh, muddy, muddy the, the waters. So it I, I, Mr. Barubala. the perspective has to be individual. If I have, Daruwala, he may empathize with the people. He may not have had an experience himself as a Dalit or whatever community, but he may empathize with them. He may feel deep suffering. He may feel their deep suffering. No, I haven't understood it properly. And what I'm trying to say I'm is sorry. that you don't necessarily always need to undergo an experience. It's like it's like a, a bereavement, you know. You may, you may not, you may not yourself be a bereaved person, but you may understand the agony of a bereaved person. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you can empathize. You can uh, put yourself in the uh, bereaver, the grief-stricken person's uh, uh, self. And, and write, that is perfectly, uh, 
that is perfectly legitimate and come out with a very satisfactory poem or a story or anything of the kind. So there's a last question about police brutality in the USA and India. Yes. Um, yes. yes. So will it yes. be inspiring any new poems from you? I have read your poems about policing, the ones you've written before. But I found this question uh, interesting. It's come from... Uh, Firstly, uh, yeah. uh, let, let me absolve myself. I retired from the police within 14 years. I joined in 58 and 74, I resigned and left police. Uh, the brutality of the police is worldwide. Yet in Europe, especially in England and in the, on the continent as well, uh, they have managed to curb the brutality. This is not happening in USA mainly because of the history of the Kalaba and the south, south uh, the, the southern part, the Alabama and all the rest. And you have to read black poetry. You have to read uh, what black novelists are writing and to imbibe what they have to go through. So, and people like Langston Hughes and, and so many others, great, uh, uh, and the, the black music is soul and, you know, what it is. So police brutality is inexcusable. And in this particular case, even that $20 bill was legitimate. It was not, uh, it was not forged. So what a terrible thing to happen. And what were the bystanders doing? There were his colleagues. If this fellow had a suddenly a mad thought in his brain or a mad impulse, the others should have dragged him away. They didn't. So not only him, but the others should also be, uh, uh, well, be investigated. I completely endorse that. I wanted to say this. I've, I've always believed, Mr. Daruwala, that uh, you know we are all implicated in an act of injustice if we yes. do not, you yes. know, take a stand and and intervene. We are all implicated then. So you're very right that the re remaining policemen, they they should have intervened. You're very right about that. Yes, and they have uh, even. Uh, I thought they had behaved oddly during the Jamia agitation and the JNU, but now I believe they are arresting uh, the other people as well. But I still feel I have been a member of the National Commission for Minorities and it has changed my life and it has changed my outlook. And I feel the, the minority has to be defended and has to be talked about. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much Dr. Dr. Uh, You've been very you good. No, it's been joyous for all of us. There, you're getting a lot of fan mail on the chat, which I can't share with you right now. Uh, but there are many, many people who uh, admire your poetry and have really enjoyed listening to you live today. I would. Now, I would like to conclude with a brief vote of thanks. Um, I'd like to uh, thank all our wonderful audience here today, all poetry lo lovers, fellow poetry lovers, Dr. Swati Pal, who conceptualized this series and uh, has invited you personally <laughs> to be our eminent guest today, uh, to the Distinguished Series uh, uh, Committee, Dr. Sandhyagar, Dr. Raja Lakshmi, and Dr. Sangeeta Gupta. And of course, above all, to Mr. Surinder for helping us uh, with everything, technically and other things. Thank you very much, sir. I Thank hope you. we can host you again and hear some more of your poems. Many thanks. I just like to say, Mr. Daruwala, as a personal tribute 
that you know one of the things that i simply love about you is the fact that you remain so grounded you are a man without any pretensions that comes across in your writing and that comes across in your demeanor and let me tell you how invaluable that is in today's world where we are also accustomed to you know a, a lot of uh, uh, you know mannerisms and so what you know so on and so forth that people put on but you are really really so humble so there's something almost childlike and lovable about you and i want you to know that and we all felt that and as namita said we are all fans of your writing but we are also fans of the persona that you are so thank you so very much it's my personal you know thanks to you thank you so much to you know for honoring us and being with us today Thank and uh, and one more thing i would like to add is that you are very young at heart and you have been very brave this has gone flawlessly the zoom sessions despite any misgivings you might you might have had mr daruwala so thank you for doing this for us and, and mr daruwala we don't see you old either you said you don't see yourself old we don't see you old either absolutely thank you thank you absolutely. thank you so much audience thank we could now perhaps uh, leave the meeting thank you mr daruwal thank you thank you thank you ha thank you and end kar do my meeting yes please thank you take care thank you thank you everyone